Okay. Am I unmuted? I don't know if I muted myself here because I muted myself on Sunday morning. I'm good. Okay. All right. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Again, we're taking a look at some judges, uh, at the judges that are in the book of Judges. And so Judges chapter number 6. And... uh, we're looking at the judge of Gideon, or the judge being Gideon, but Gideon's uh, account takes um, three chapters. And so we're going to take this in parts. <laughs> I'm not going to go through three chapters of information in 20 minutes. Uh, there's just too much here. And so today we'll be looking at verses 1 through 24 uh, in, uh, in the account or under the judge of Gideon. So Judges chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. And uh, first of all, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 and, and looking and seeing what's happening there. Uh, there's, there's a couple of different uh, um, situations that are happening here. And uh, so I've divided them up. Uh, So that's how we'll look at it. So Judges chapter 1, we'll read down through verse number 10 and see uh, where the the children of Israel are, how they got to be where they are, the circumstances, uh, and all of that. So again, Judges chapter 6, verse number 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel... And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the uh, mountains, and clay, uh, caves, and strongholds. And so it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east, even they came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, till thou come to Gaza, and, no, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass, For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, because of the Midianites. We'll stop there for a moment, and then we'll look at verses 8 through 10 here in just a second. Uh, but you can see what happened here. The children of Israel did sight in the, uh, evil in the sight of the Lord again. The Lord delivered them into the Midianites. And this says for seven years. Now, if you look back over the last couple of captivities, this is the shortest one. However, this is the most brutal one. It drove the children of Israel into the mountains to live in caves and dens and strongholds. And so the oppression was they were so oppressed in the cities that they fled the cities and they, and they moved up into uh, the mountain areas. And, and you can see in verse number 3, And so it was when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and encamped against them and destroyed the Inkies increase of the earth and so what happened was when it was harvest time the Midianites the Amalekites and the children of the east would steal the harvest and it left no food whatsoever for Israel and you can see the the next verse down Uh, they they took they left no sustenance for Israel neither sheep nor ox nor ass so there was nothing living that the children of Israel was able to eat or to harvest, or anything like that. And so this oppression was an, was an oppression. Uh, uh, now the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east, they were kind of like gypsies that would travel around and they encamped here and started just stealing from, the, from, from, the, from Israel. Now, they were armed, and we're going to see that later. There's about 135,000 armed men. Uh, And they were able to subdue Israel so much so that they scared them. And like I said, scared them into hiding. 
All right, and then in verse number 8, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you out of, uh, up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of, the, uh, of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you've not obeyed my voice. So in that, the Lord sends a prophet. Now, the, does the Lord care? If the Lord didn't care, he wouldn't send a prophet. And so he sends a prophet. And by the way, the prophets, the messenger here isn't important, is it? It's the message. Because we don't ever get the prophet's name. So it's not the messenger that's important here. It's the message. And what's the message? I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of bondage. I brought you through the wilderness. I brought you into the promised land. You, I gave you the, the land and I gave you one rule. And you broke it. You obeyed not my voice. And so you are where you are because of you. You are where you are because of you. Verse number 11, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the uh, uh, Beazrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. So do you see what Gideon is doing? He's hiding the threshing of wheat. So that's the separating the kernel from the, from the husk. He, he's, he's got to do it in hiding because he doesn't want the Midianites to see that he's doing and they come and they steal the food that he's, he's gathering for, for his family. And the angel of the Lord shows up. So first of all, we have a prophet showing up. And then we have an angel of the Lord showing up. And he, he says again there in verse number 12, the, the latter part of it, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And uh, Gideon, Gideon's like, who are you talking to? Because in a minute we're going to see I'm the least of, my tribe is the least of all of Israel and I'm the least of my family. So basically I'm a nobody and yet you're calling me a mighty man of valor. And uh, what the angel was showing here was not what Gideon was, but what Gideon will be. And how will Gideon be a mighty man of valor? Well, the phrase before that, the Lord is with him. How is Gideon going be to uh, be a great man? Because the Lord's with him. Because the Lord is there. And in verse 13, And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, here comes the accusation. Here's how, here's how we are as human beings. Here's the accusations. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? So guys, answer the question. Why is it that Israel is now oppressed by the Midianites? Is it because God is mean or is it because they were disobedient? Yeah, because doesn't it say up, to, up here in verse number uh, 10, but you have not obeyed my voice? And so Gideon is saying, well, God, you did this to me. All right, let's bring it to today. How many times do we blame God for stuff that's going on that's not God's fault? It's because we've not obeyed his voice. It's because we've been disobedient. We know what his word says, and yet we would say, eh. And so the first accusation that, that Gideon brings to the Lord, if, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is, this, is all this befallen us? Well, we know the answer is because they obeyed not the voice. The second one is, where be all his miracles which our fathers, did, uh, our fathers told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? He, had he not just heard from the prophet 
the prophet said, I brought you up out of Egypt. But he forgot the part where he said, and you obeyed not my voice. So the prophet told him, the prophet said, yeah, I brought you up out of Egypt. Yeah, I'm strong enough to do that. Yes, I, brought, I delivered you from the Amorites. Yes, you went into their land. Yes, you were able to subdue the land. I gave you a rule. He said in verse number 10, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in, in whose land you dwell, but you've not obeyed my voice. That word fear there has the idea of submit yourself to. We're going to see in a little bit that Gideon's going to tear down some groves to some idols because the children of Israel now worshiping Baal, Ashtaroth, Balaam, everybody else but God. And so where are all the miracles which our fathers told us of saying, did not the Lord bring us up from, the, from Egypt? Well, where, where are those miracles? Well, you can't have those miracles if you're disobedient. Right? God doesn't bless disobedience. Then the third accusation here. But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Did the Lord really forsake them or did he keep his promise? Because he told them in the past that uh, if, you, if you worship other gods, I'm going to judge you. And the way he's judged in the past is he's brought nations to subdue Israel. I mean, we just read, what, three judges? Four judges? How many judges have we looked at? Four? Four accounts in their recent history. Don't follow other gods. What did they do? They followed other gods. What happened? God sent somebody to oppress them. So the Lord doesn't forsake. We just remove ourselves from the umbrella of his protection. You know, and we do that often today, don't we? It's not that the Lord has moved. His umbrella of protection is right here. It's right here. And what we've done is we've stepped out from his umbrella of protection. And then what happens? Well, the full judgment falls right on us. We have no protection. And it's not God that's moved. It's us that, that's moved. And so when we honestly look at these three accusations, we can certainly see us in this picture, that we do the exact same thing, but then we can see that the exact same answer that applied to Gideon applies to us. It's not God that's doing it, it's us that did it. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. Verse number 14, And the Lord looked, up, looked upon him and said, Go in this in thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. It's almost like this angel didn't even hear what Gideon said because he didn't address it, did he? But he does go into the promise of what's going to happen. And again, I see several promises here. The first one is, And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Have not I sent thee? Now, we're going to see through some indicators here that this angel of the Lord is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. So when the, when the angel or the Lord says, have not I sent thee, does, the, does an angel have authority to send a human being to do anything? An angel does not have that authority. Now, the Lord can give that message through an angel, but this doesn't say, and God is going to send you. It says, have not I sent you? And so the indication here is this angel of the Lord is that Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. We'll see later on there's a worship that goes on, and this, this, 
this angel receives that worship. And an angel never receives worship. The Lord does, though. Then the next thing I see, in verse number 15, I see the other two. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto, the, uh, unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And so there's the second promise. So the first promise is, you're going to save Israel. The second promise is, I'm going to be with you. The third one is, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. So we see all of these promises given to Gideon here at the very beginning by this angel. And again, indications are this is the Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And in verse 17, he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. And I've heard some people say, man, Gideon was just a man that seriously liked faith because he's questioning everything. He's got an angel directly talking to him. And now he wants a sign saying that an angel is talking to him. Like it's unbelief. But we need to be careful. In uh, 1 John, hold your place here and turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. We're actually given a New Testament command. Of course, 1 John isn't written in Judges. It's going to be several thousand years later. <laughs> but the principle is still around. 1 John chapter number 4. Go all the way back to the book of Revelation and come back a couple of books and you'll be there. 1 John chapter 4. And we'll just start in verse number 1 and we'll read a couple of verses there. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so we see here maybe an indicator of why Gideon is seeking a sign from this angel, not out of unbelief, but just to make sure that the message that he's receiving is from God. Again, in, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, we've got to try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that, if, uh, it, that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. And so in the world is the spirit of Antichrist. And in the world there are spirits that will come and speak to us and tell us nice little things. It is not wrong for us to say, Lord, can you prove yourself? And that's what Gideon is saying here. So let's go back to Judges. Turn back to, to Judges again. In verse number 17, he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Uh, the request continues on in verse 18. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he, this is the angel of the Lord, said, I will tarry until thou come again. Do you think he was offended because Gideon wanted a sign? No, because the Holy Spirit is the author of all of the scriptures, and in the Holy Spirit's mind, 1 John was already written, where it says, try every spirit. And so Gideon was within his right to try that spirit to see if it was of God. And so the angel there didn't get offended. No, he said, I'll, okay, I'll tell you till you come. I'll wait until you come back. Now look what Gideon does. You remember what Gideon was doing? He was threshing wheat hidden because the Midianites were coming and stealing all the food. And so there was little to no food whatsoever in the land of Israel. Now look what happens. Verse 19, and Gideon went in and made ready a what? That's a young goat. That's not a child. Okay. 
say it's not human sacrifice here. I like the, the meme that, that John posted this morning about the quokka. The, uh, the animal? The, the, that's the right name, right? The coke, where they toss their young at predators. Uh, and the meme said, well, you can't blame us. If, if God didn't want us to do that, he wouldn't have made them so tossable. So the kid that we're talking about here is not a child. It's a goat. All right, so he made ready a goat. How many of those were in the land? Go back up with me to verse number uh, uh, five. For they came up with their, uh, with their uh, nope, that's not it, uh, verse number four. And left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So there's like almost no animals there for eating. And so this sacrifice that Gideon is preparing is a real sacrifice. He went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes with an ephah of flour. How much wheat was in the land? Well, he's threshing it in secret because the Midianites are stealing it. The flesh he put in a basket and he put uh, the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and he presented it. So again, you can see in this the, the sacrifice that was really given here. It wasn't just a small thing. It was a huge sacrifice for Gideon. You know, when we read it, we're like, okay, he made ready a kid, and unleavened cakes, made a flour and everything. But you look at the circumstances, there were no kids. There was hardly any flour. Probably this sacrifice that he made to the Lord would have fed his family for at least a couple of nights, if not a week. Verse number 20, And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the, bro the broth. And he, he did so that he hears Gideon. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there arose up fire out of the what? Do rocks burn? Have you ever tried to light a rock? I mean, we use rocks to light wood, <laughs> right? We try to hit, strike flint, and we try to strike and make, a, make a, a spark or something, but you never on purpose take a piece of wood and try to light a rock. As a matter of fact, we, you would, we would use rocks to outline a fire pit to keep the fire in because rocks do not burn. And so we're seeing here the proof that the, that the sacrifice was acceptable. The Lord, or the angel here, does, performs a miracle by lighting a rock on fire. He touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there rose up fire out of the rock. By the way, you, you know, just another little small point. Where was the broth? By the way, what is broth? Help me out here. What's, what's broth? Like, like yeah, beef stock and, and a bunch of water, right? Or chicken stock, beef stock, kid stock. I'm, I'm looking at Valerie right now. I could have a little Valerie stock. Dip Valerie into a pot and boil it up a little bit, get a little bit of... Valerie juice in there. But that's what broth is, right? It's the majority of water. All right, does water, do we use water to light fires or we do, do we use water to put fires out? Well, he poured the broth over the rocks. And then he lit the rock on fire. Do you guys see that? Or, or am I stretching the truth here? Do you see that or am I stretching it? There arose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon had perceived that he was 
an angel of the Lord, by the way, the angel of the Lord, oh no. <laughs> Gideon said, alas, O oh Lord God. For because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. He's like, oh no. Oh no, he probably remembered Moses' words. If you'll hold your place here and go back to Exodus chapter 33. I'm almost done. Only 45 more minutes to go. Free pie at, uh, at, um, at uh, Village Inn will still be there. Exodus 33 and verse number 18. Exodus 33 and verse number 18. So Gideon's probably thinking of these, of these words of Moses because he's saying, Alas, O Lord God, I've seen you. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 18, this is a conversation between God and Moses. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim uh, the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall, for there shall no man see me and what? Live. And live. So you can't even see God and live. And I'm sure these are the words that are going through Gideon's mind as he's sitting there realizing that that was the Lord that was in front of him. And he says, Alas, O Lord God. I've seen him face to face. And if any man shall see me, there shall, for there shall no man see me and live. All right, back to uh, Judges chapter 6. So let's take a look at the last two verses here. The response here to Gideon's oh no moment. He's like, no! Nah! I'm going to die. The angel's response is this, and the Lord said unto him, by the way, we move from the angel to the Lord, do we not? Do you see that? And so Jehovah, Yihyeh, which is the Hebrew word, said unto him, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, it is yet in, in Ophrah of the uh, uh, Beazerites. Beazerites. But look at the word Jehovah Shalom. Do you guys know what Shalom means? Peace. Yeah. It's, it is. It's peace. Uh, and so we have Jehovah Shalom. And so the Hebrew here again is Yihya Shalom. And so the God of peace. God is peace. Now again, these verses haven't been written, but in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord of peace. And so Gideon was, was seeing God face to face. And the, and the Lord was saying to him, it's okay. I am, I'm, gonna, I'm here to help you. I'm here to use you. We saw that earlier. I'm going to send you. You're going to be uh, the savior of the people. You're going to save Israel. I'm going to save Israel through you. <laughs> and here's the proof of it. I'm not going to kill you. Isn't that great? Well, what an answer to prayer that I'm going to be used to save the children of Israel from the Midianites and God doesn't kill me before that happens. Uh, that's just a, an affirmation that you're the guy. Uh, and so 
We're going to stop the story right here, stop the account right here. We'll pick it up uh, here next week because we're going to see the, the, the fleece um, thing that everybody always refers back to. We throw out fleeces all the time. Uh, well, only one guy in the scriptures ever did it. And should that become a practice for all Christians? Well, that's going to be something we're going to look at. And then the actual saving of uh, the children of Israel. All right, questions or comments from verses 1 through 24? 